Esteban is from Mexico City, which is the world's largest city. And uh, if you are trying to build in the world's largest city where there is no more land available and where local regulation prevents you from putting up anything that's higher than eight floors. Exactly, in the historic what center. What do you do? This is the answer. Thank you. Okay, my company's called Bunker, and why would a guy name a uh, company Bunker? Well, back in 2005, when I recently graduated from college, I landed my first small commission to refurbish a small cafeteria. I took the job, I wanted to start my own practice. I needed to find an office to work, so I found this small storage room in the basement of an office building. It was a windowless, cold, badly illuminated space, an actual bunker, hence the name. And in Bunker, we've been able to explore and experiment architecture in the widest possible scale, from small iconic chapels for private clients to a master plan of an entire city. But we also have another profession in, bar in Bunker. It's, we're frustrated cartoonists. We do cartoons about almost every situation we find ourselves in, about ourselves, about our clients, our profession, in an effort to demystify the figure of the architect as a genius, untouchable, misunderstood. We think architecture is a very serious profession and should be treated so, but that doesn't mean we need to take ourselves that seriously. We do cartoons about a giant silver toilet that serves as a museum built by the richest man in the world, Carlos Slim, for her daughter. We do cartoons about our masters and mentors, about obese cities and slim cities. We also do cartoons about why Mexican architects can't seem to get out of the jar because they keep pulling their legs as small crabs. The economy has changed and now Money doesn't represent that much value, as does followers, community, and likes. This is how we imagine ourselves fighting in this bunker against the gray mass of sameness, against conventionalism. But in reality, how we look in everyday life, it's like this. <laughs> well, almost. We eventually, after two years, got out of this bunker, and now we have an office with windows, something we really appreciate. <laughs> but bunker is about teamwork, and it's about having a team of very talented architects, designers, and urbanists in order to have accomplished so many projects in such little time. I'm going to talk a bit about my work before going into the project I was invited here to talk about. This is a wedding garden in the city of Cuernavaca. We were commissioned a small ch wedding chapel. This is what the client was expected, a closed wall masonry chapel. We thought it was an error to close the chapel to the beautiful surrounding garden, so we decided to do quite the opposite. We built an open glass chapel to let the garden flow into the space, that at night it lights up like a crystal lantern. And the cross is a cutout in this glass veil, a window that invites you out to the garden. This was our first religious commission that led to our second religious commission. A client that visited this chapel invited us to do a replicate in a site he owned in Acapulco, but it had a completely different purpose. It was a chapel for a garden of crypts meant to grieve death. This was the site, and when we arrived at the site, we knew we were, we were in quite a trouble because there was this giant rock that was blocking the main view to the sunset. And our client, obviously not an architect, suggested putting like great stilts on the first chapel in order to block the view, something that reminded us of a painting of Dali, <laughs> the temptations of St. Augustine. And we convinced him instead of doing a specific project for his site. If the first chapel celebrated life, and the second chapel grieved death. This made him 
opposite antagonistic chapels, so they had to be complete opposites. If one was transparent, the second had to be solid. If one was glass, the second had to be concrete, light, ethereal versus heavy, earthly, classical proportions versus irregular geometry. This is the project we presented to our client, and obviously he didn't like it. He said it looked like a spaceship from a Star Wars movie, and it did look like a spaceship. <laughs> but we convinced him by telling him that it was a spaceship to take the soul to the other side. And that's how he fell in love with the project. <laughs> we wanted the project, this new chapel, to look like a giant rock that culminated the mountain because the mountains of Acapulco are composed of these giant granite rocks. So it does look like a, an artificial rock that culminates the mountain. The inclination of the chapel responds to the inclination of the rock it has in front. You access through a crack in this artificial rock, spectacular views to the Bay of Acapulco, and the axis of the cross is orientated with the axis of the equinox, so twice a year the sun sets exactly behind the cross. As architects, we jump in different scales, and now we go to a very extra, extra small scale. This project started when we found out that dogs were very sad because architects didn't pay attention to them. <laughs> Their houses were old, abandoned, even cats had taken appropriation of their houses. Or they were living in synthetic, with no design at all, houses. Because architects had never designed a house for a dog. And when they did, the result was catastrophic. And this is how this project was born. It's an exhibition I inaugurated last night where, where 10 young Mexican firms reinvent the house for a dog. It's inspired in a project by Ken Jahara, Architecture for Dogs. And our house parts from the premise of this curious thing, how the dog chases his own tail. Well, our house is the house that chases itself. And obviously, we had to have a very long dog for the photo shoot. <laughs> But what I love about architecture is how you can jump between different scales, and one day you're designing a small house for a dog, and the next day you're envisioning a master plan for an entire city. This is the master plan we won. It was a competition for Guzman City, uh, an hour south of Guadalajara. Uh, this is the project we developed. We actually got to build the first phase that was the Fountain Plaza, where it has embedded fountains in the ground, to serve as a spectacle for the children to play, also as a luminous spectacle at night. Also, sustainability has played an important role in our office. In this exhibition that holds every year in Mexico, it's the largest construction and architecture exhibition in Mexico. All the architecture brands and construction brands, they build these pavilions, but after a week, these pavilions end up in the trash generating a lot of pollution, we asked ourselves, could we do a pavilion with recycled materials that would generate zero waste? So we went to this major soda company. We asked them to lend us 5,000 soda crates, and this is what we built. This is uh, the cafeteria for the exhibition. And the interesting thing is that it's simply soda crates piled on top of each other, and when the exhibition was over, the pavilion was dismantled, and the soda crates came back to carry soda pops. Also, we've been commissioned to transform abandoned structures into pieces of uh, contemporary architecture, like this residential building in Acapulco. We transformed it like the TV shows now today, that they transform not-so-gracious people into real TV stars. Well, that same way, we did an architectural extreme makeover, and we transformed this old and abandoned structure into a piece of contemporary architecture. We've also been commissioned uh, a hotel. This hotel that we built in Mexico City, we wanted to break the monotonous routine of the typical executive that continuously travels and stays in the same hotel, and it's the same experience because they all look alike. We wanted to generate a hotel that every 
recurring visit would be a unique experience. So we imagine each suite of the 15 to be with a different spatial arrangement, contained in a different geometrical form, all piled on top of each other like a giant urban Tetris. And this was the result of this unique hotel. I've always been, besides cartoons and architecture, interested in ideas, and especially in big ideas. But how do you come up with big ideas? Well, by asking yourself big questions. Mexico City is one of the largest, most populated, most extensive cities in the world. We asked ourselves, what could we do to try to stop this voracious urban sprawl? The center of Mexico City is like a giant layered cake composed of cities in different periods in its time. The first layer is the Aztec city that was constructed on top of the lake. In the Spanish conquest, the Spanish built their first Christian temples on top of the pyramids, and eventually their whole colonial city was built on top of the Aztec city, transforming today in one of the largest and most extensive cities in the world. You can see as the original city started to grow in size in that lake, the urban sprawl grew in size, the lake diminished until finally it completely disappeared. So this is the actual condition of Mexico City. It's an uncontrolled urban expansion. What we proposed was to redefine, redensify the center of the city to try to stop that expansion. But how can you redensify the center of a city that is completely overpopulated with historic buildings that you can't touch, you can't demolish, you can't build on top of them, you can't build past their height, there are no empty plots to build new spaces, and the historic center needs new spaces, especially residential and office, because it's completely dominated by a commercial use. So in a kind of a ludicrous and ironic sense, we told ourselves, what happens if we build these new spaces in the ideal empty plot of the historic center? The historic square, the Zocalo, the main plaza, the religious, economical, political, cultural heart of the Mexicans. But obviously the first question is, should we build in a public plaza? Doing a vertical building would diminish the iconic presence of the buildings that contain the plaza, so that's why we discarded this option. Doing a horizontal building would also imply demolishing these buildings, so that's why we discarded this option. What happens if we go where we have no limitations? We go down, and instead of building a skyscraper, we build an earth scraper. The pyramidal form is a result of the lateral forces of the Earth that are less on an inclined structure than on a vertical structure to dotate the Earth scraper with natural light and illumination. We generated a giant void in its interior. All the archaeological um, monuments that we'll find in the process of excavation, we'll reconstruct them in the first 10 floors of the Earth scraper. Then we would have retail, then living, and at the bottom, office spaces. But obviously, it would be an error to leave a giant hole in what was before the most important plaza in Mexico. So that's why we propose covering that giant hole with a glass floor so all the activities could continue to get along with the life of the earth scraper. It's a 300 meter underground structure, and the central void reminds us of uh, the original sketches of Giacomo Piranesi. It would be a building with no parking spaces because the historic center doesn't need any more cars. So we recover the subway station that passes underneath the main plaza. We expand it and we, con we convert it into the main access to the building. This is how the museum 
would look like in the first 10 floors, how we can reconstruct those arche archaeological monuments we find in the process of excavation. Then we would have retail, we would have at the bottom the office spaces. But obviously one of the questions we ask ourselves is, how can we get natural light 300 meters under the ground? There's this project that's been developed in New York called the Low Line, and it's a project that pretends to transform uh, an abandoned trolley station into a green urban park with natural light. They're exploring this uh, channeling of natural light through fiber optic systems, so this could be an option to bring light to the lowest floors of the earth scraper. We, we would have green lobbies every 10 floors to try to inject some vegetation into this huge syn synthetic space. To communicate in this great void, we would have the rotary communers that would take you from one side to the other side of the earth scraper and how it compares itself to other skyscrapers in Mexico City. And at night, it turns up and it converts itself in the plaza of light. This project, we've been pushing to present it to the government. We've met with some local authorities. Right now, they haven't been so interested in, in going along with this project, but we got to publish it in a, an architecture blog, and it was like throwing a match in a dry crop field. Suddenly, it all lit up, and it got published in more than 250,000 blog sites, internet, radio shows, TV shows, magazines, newspapers, books. It even got into headline news in CNN. And after this, we started getting some very strange calls. Uh, an American hip-hop producer called us to acquire an earth scraper to put it in a mountain he had just bought in Spokane, Washington. <laughs> he wanted to transform it into living units so people could find refuge before the world ended in uh, 2012. And then he knew that the world would not end, so he would then turn it into a casino and a shopping mall. But I'm glad that didn't go through. Also, we got a call from an Arab group. They wanted an earth scraper in Mecca. And the government of Sweden also contacted us because their historic center, also built on top of a lake, they found out it was also, it could be a viable solution for their historic center. So they asked permission to present our project to the government, and maybe they will build an earth scraper. But the purpose is that it's an idea, and it's an idea that traveled around the world and inspired other projects and was a viable solution to a real problem. And I'd like to finish my lecture with this. The first cartoon we did It's this figure, Bunker, fighting against conventional buildings in a wrestling match. We know architecture is a very serious profession and should be treated so, but that's not because we need to take ourselves so seriously. We need to learn to laugh at ourselves every now and then. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, Esteban, I want to thank you for responding so quickly and yes. so very much at the last minute. But I want to explain to you, take a little detour about why my heart leapt when I first came across references to the earth scraper. Um, this is the CN Tower here in Toronto. At one time, this was purportedly the tallest freestanding structure in the world. And uh, I don't know how many of you either remember or experienced a ride that I built in the CN Tower called Tour of the Universe. A couple million people went through it over the years. It was a thrill ride based on simulated movement. And the conceit was that there was a spaceport under the CN Tower, the mirror image of the CN Tower underground, Mm. and the shuttle was launched through the core of the tower out on a tour of the universe. I desperately, all night, looked for the illustration that we made at mm. the time. Regrettably, was not able to find it, but I felt a little surge when I came across your plan. I think it's sensational. Thank I hope you. it gets built. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you.